Okay, I think we'll begin. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Let me just get... Okay. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Catholic SG200 Festival, and I'm very happy to see everyone here joining us today. Um, so today we're here for um, journeying towards a God-centered marriage. And before we start, I just need to go through a few simple COVID house rules. Please bear with us. Um, and we seek your co cooperation with um, keeping your masks on at all times and keeping a one meter distance apart. Um, food and drinks are not permitted. If you are drinking from your own water bottles, please put on your masks after drinking. Um, there will not be a toilet break uh, during this session, so if you need to go, just please feel free. You don't need to raise your hand or ask for permission, just go. Um, but try, if you can, to, to go alone, not in groups. And, um, sorry, let me, forgot to, yeah, okay, sorry, I forgot to click this thing. Um, and should you have any questions that you would like to ask us, you can scan this QR code. Later on, the, um, on each page, there will also be a QR code, so if you miss this one, it's okay. Um, it will lead you to a page where you can just type in questions, and then our group will receive them, um, and we will try our best to answer what we can. Right. Thank you for your attention, and we can begin our session today. We're just going to do a quick introduction uh, uh, about who we are. So today we're having our, our talk on journeying towards a God-centered marriage, and it's by us, the Catholic Engaged Encounter Community. Um, we are a prep marriage preparation program. Not we are, but CEE is a prep um, preparation uh, for marriage program. And it's co a community of volunteers support couples preparing for marriage over a weekend. Usually before COVID hit, we would do face-to-face -face weekends. Right now, it's via Zoom. Um, but we are hoping to go back to face-to-face -to -face soon. And it's over a weekend of rather intense talks and sharings by our presenting couples like such. Um, and um, very open communication between the couples themselves. And um, the Catholic Engaged Encounters tagline is a wedding is a day, a marriage is a lifetime. And this is exactly why we will be talking about, uh, what we will be talking about today. How do we walk towards a marriage that is God-centered? And we will be answering some common questions that we have compiled from couples over the weekends. Our discussion will cover five themes, um, dating and building the relationship, embracing the extended family, God in your marriage, finance in marriage, and then finally, the gift of children. Hello, welcome. Uh, we, the presenters, would like to also inform that when whatever we share is how we experience and live marriage from the inside, and we are still working at our own relationships and have no magic formula. Our sharing is personal and authentic, and thus we would appreciate if you respect our privacy as well by not sharing further and posting on social media from today. Um, we are also all not here today to discuss the church's stance on marriage. We are sharing uh, personally about the role uh, and importance of God in our marriages. Okay, so I'm going to start with myself. I am Ashley. I'm very happy to meet all of you. And I'm the moderator for today's discussion. I'm married to Mervyn, who cannot be here today because he's at Reservist. Um, we've been married 10 years and we have two daughters, one seven and one one. We also have two dogs. Sometimes I don't know how I manage, but I do go crazy at times. <laughs> but it's very, at the end of the day, I think I find a lot of joy, of course, in my family and with my pets at home. Um, I run, uh, we're both, uh, Mervyn and I are both entrepreneurs. I run a childcare centre and Mervyn runs a business, two businesses, one in AV and one in networking. Um, most of the time we find ourselves very busy, but I think at the end of the day, we wanted to somehow find somewhere we could serve together because we've been praying about how we can serve together. I think it's, um, for a Catholic couple, to me, I think it's important to serve together, and um, we found CEE um, and have been serving since this year, so we're pretty new in the community. Um, just a little bit more background, um, I have known Mervyn, my husband, for more than half my life. I had a crush on him when I was 15 years old, and we met in church. 
he was the cool lead guitarist in our praise and worship band, and I was the very nerdy backup singer. But he married me in the end, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so yeah, thank you uh, for joining us today. And um, today we have with us Alan and Marie over here on my left, and further down we have Christine and Andrew. Um, Alan and Marie, would you like to introduce yourselves? So um, I'm Alan, <laughs> here with my wife Marie. We've been married for about 19 years. Um, I work as a country manager for a couple of markets in the health and wellness space. And uh, over to you. Hi, thank you Ashley for the very nice introduction. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Marie, I'm here with my husband Alan. Uh, we've uh, uh, been with EE since Can you hear me? Yeah. So we've been with EE since we attended ourselves uh, as participants, and we started presenting only in 2005. Uh, we have uh, three children, uh, and one dog and one cat. <laughs> yeah, our kids are uh, 15, 16, 15, and nine year old. And uh, uh, so I'm I'm in. Hello. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a HR manager in a digital marketing company. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. Over to Christine and Andrew. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. Um, Christine and I have been married for about three years, uh, but dating for about eight. We're still quite new in this whole marriage thing, so uh, figuring it out as the days go by. Uh, I'm a businessman. I'm a consultant in the FMB space. And Christine is a dispute lawyer. My husband, being my husband, has said everything necessary. <laughs> so anything else we will share during our discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Christine and Drew. Thank you, Ellen and Marie. So we're going to start today um, with our first topic. Um, OK, sorry, that's us. And our first topic, dating and building your relationship. So as couples get to know each other during the dating phase, um, deciding whether or not the person they are dating is the right one. Um, for many men, deciding whether or not to propose to their ladies, or even some women nowadays who feel ready to pop the question to their guys, um, and then navigating through the engagement period. What are some important topics couples might want to discuss about before getting married? I think this is really important, the before getting married part, right? Andrew and Christine, would you care to share about your thoughts and experience on this? Um, like I said uh, earlier, I, I'm a businessman, an uh, entrepreneur, and uh, we've been dating quite a number of years before uh, we decided to get married. So we were, we were quite comfortable in uh, a day-to-day. -day. We, we thought we talked, uh, talked about everything already, but uh, as we progressed on closer and closer to the wedding, there were changes in uh, the business. So I closed the business, business just before um, the wedding, which isn't the, the, the best thing financially. And then we had the, the banquet to pay. All this pre-COVID, uh, so it's a quite a hefty sum, 600 people. Um, there was the, the wedding banquet to pay. There was HDB to pay, a lot of things to pay, a lot of people to pay. Uh, and of course, um, if, if we, after we got married and we were blessed with children, then that was also on, you know, we had to put aside some money for, for that. Um, and it was only at EE where we actually had to sit down and talk about these things, and I found that this was quite helpful, quite useful, uh, and we both, you know, discussed our finances, hidden debts, uh, you know, what we want to do in future, where should the money allocation be, and stuff like that, and it was good to be on the same page and kind of accept each other for, for what we wanted to do with the potential, like, matrimonial money. So at the time, um, Andrew closed his business. Uh, this was in 2018. And um, you know, being a lawyer, my reaction was like, oh, if you're going to close the business, then although the company has uh, debts to clear, uh, you know, they will just die with the company. Because practically, the creditors will go after the company if they want to, right? But this is my lawyerly thinking. But I She's kept me out of trouble quite a lot. <laughs> yes, anyway. sir. He's very welcome. <laughs> but I mean, the the... But I could see how important it was for Andrew. 
uh, that there were certain debts that he wanted to pay personally. I was like, oh my goodness, are you stupid? Or are you like, you know, really, really a good person, right? But a poor businessman. Yeah, but because it was so important for Andrew, um, then we had a discussion on how we were going to manage it together. So of course, there was going to be implications on uh, you know, the financial planning for the what, wedding banquet and we, we, were, we were going to get a flat, a resale flat um, and then the down payment and everything, renovations, so all these things. Um, uh, like Andrew said, we, did, we didn't have to, I, sp I suppose, speak so much about the finances until closer to the wedding. And then with this development, then it prompted us to be a bit more candid with each other. So when we attended EE, there was, of course, um, uh, guidelines on how to man have these discussions and we attended E in 2017. So it helped us in 2018 later on. And until today, I suppose, now that we've been married for three years, uh, we, also, we also make it a point to check in on you know, what's a priority, what's necessary, what's a luxury, what's good to have, actually not necessary. And uh, it's kind of an ongoing conversation that we do have. So I think finance is very important. Yeah, and that kind of opened um, the rest of the discussion topics, like without money, you know, uh, we talked about our dreams and aspirations as well. Mm. Like, I uh, wanted to do... I studied uh, psychology in university, mm. and I'm, I'm supposed to go and do my master's. I, I opened a bar instead, but yeah. master's was always in the books. And money still needs to be set aside for, for studies. And um, after talking about finance, it kind of opened to other topics. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the other uh, topics that was important to the two of us, which we also discussed, was... Um, our family and future, what, our fam what kind of family do we want to build and also how our respective families, we want them to feature in our lives moving forward. Uh, so we both come from uh, close-knit families and um, we had agreed that we want there to be strong bonding between the families mm. and also with our in-laws, uh, which can be a bit tricky. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, for our children to be close to grandparents, for our children to be close to cousins, for us uh, as uncle and aunties to be close to nieces and nephews, these were things that we knew we wanted for sure. But it's very easy to say, it's very hard to do. Uh, and the commitment was not only to um, you know, be present at family dinners or Chinese New Year at Christmas, uh, but also to, to check in on our siblings a bit more frequently because Andrew has five siblings. I know, by now, all married or have partners, some have children, I have two sisters. Um, and uh, one is married. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, by the time you plan to meet every couple um, and then you add on the birthdays and um, the mm -hmm. occasions, we are pretty meeting them pretty frequently. But again, at the big gatherings, you may not be able to have uh, good catch-ups or really understand, like, you know, how they are growing, what's concerning them, can we help them in any way? Uh, so we are talking all the time, or rather, we do make it a point to coordinate our schedules uh, to make to to achieve um, this 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 couple goal that we have. Yeah. yeah. So this was all discussed like a business plan meeting before we got married. By the way, <laughs> it sounds like there was a <laughs> lot of practical topics covered. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, also, would you have any advice, Andrew and Christine? I mean, you covered a lot of very practical things for couples um, to talk about. But how would you suggest that a couple starts that kind of conversation? I think you have to be open to talk about anything um, and not be defensive, especially for topics that uh, you have pushed under the rug or pushed aside for for a while. I think for us, maybe it was the in-laws topic, but um, it comes to a point where you need to be open and, and just talk about it. Yeah, uh, it sounds like it, it takes quite a lot of courage, I guess, yeah. in a sense, right? and trust. Yeah. Yeah. And, and unity, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to tackle or be in that mindset where we are united as a couple to tackle these yeah. uh, issues, potential issues. Yeah. I think perhaps, depending on the personality of each of you, you may want to raise a subject in a different manner. And also, as we have learned and been advised repeatedly, timing is very important. <laughs> right? You want to raise an important topic, you must choose the time. But the person, the other, your, your partner is not stressed, uh, it's a good frame of mind. After and you, you eat. Have you have, you have time <laughs> to have that discussion. Uh, I think for Andrew and I, uh, he's more vocal and he's more open to you know, just say something candidly. For me, I still struggle um, with, uh, with saying ex ex to identifying exactly what I'm unhappy about. 
So you know about how, you know, there is people commonly complain, yeah, women don't actually say what they really want, right? Uh, I mean, to me, it was true to a certain extent, but uh, Andrew did help me along during our dating, our periods of dating. Uh, and I'll explain later on because I think he, for him, it was like, oh, you know, if you're not happy about something, we have to talk about it. Um, and for me, it's like, oh, it's very, very difficult. Um, but we eventually agreed to a compromise, like, you know, if we were quarreling or if I was not happy about something. But I didn't want to talk about it at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, he would be okay with it, right? And I tried to negotiate before. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Then he's like, no, 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 you cannot. Maybe can you, can you do like 30 minutes and stay all like an hour? You take the time that you need. And then later on, we... Eat something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then later on, we, we circle back to it. And I think he helped me to articulate um, what it was that was causing me unhappy. So, of course, over years of practice, uh, it has become easier for us, uh, you know, to sometimes we can read each other a bit better. Like, okay, 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 I think he's not happy about something. I better not probe. You know, let's discuss it later. We pack it later for discussion. Um, yeah, but it's a lot of, um, I think, effort to try to understand each other. Be patient even when you're upset with the other person, even if you think mm-hmm. you're right, you know, which I always think I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. just to, to give that person time and space to, to firstly be ready to talk and then listen patiently yes. when, when you're talking about yeah. the issues, right? Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew and Christine, for sharing about that. Now we're going to have the next question for Ellen and Marie. So, Ellen and Marie, how do I know? This is a question that some people ask during weekends, right? How do I know that the person I am marrying is the right person for me. Ellen and Marie? Okay, so... So, uh, uh, Ellen and I, we met each other in university. Uh, we were in different colleges, and uh, we met uh, during a Catholic uh, college, inter-college uh, fest, uh, festival. So at that time, we were just friends. Uh, we didn't really go through the dating phase. Uh, we went for a, a college camp, and then uh, we attended each other's uh, birthday parties, and we had a big group of friends. So uh, we never foresaw, foresaw that we will get married one day. And it was only uh, when uh, I attended uh, his brother's uh, birthday party at home uh, that uh, his mom saw me. So ours is more like an arranged love kind of marriage. Uh, he will share more on that. Okay. Uh, so it was, but it was during our. Uh, so what happened was that um, when we got to know each other a bit better, uh, we st- we still kept in touch. I came, I came. So both of us actually studied in India, and I came to Singapore first. And uh, we were in touch over. E- in those days, there was no email, as such. It was handwritten letters. <laughs> so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, uh, maybe the first hotmail account I opened was to communicate with him. <laughs> Truly <And> hotmail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. So it was a uh, sort of a long distance uh, relationship for a while, and then uh, eventually he he he. He proposed to me on the phone, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, uh, because I had only known him as a friend, and uh, we thought that okay, let's uh, let him come to Singapore, and we attended our EE weekend. Uh, we had not uh, decided on uh, um, this actually. What happened was we thought that uh, we'll go for the wedding, and we went to our a parish priest, and he said that, no, you marriage preparation course is not done uh, overnight. You have to attend a uh, weekend. So we were quite shocked that we have to attend a three-day program in Pungol. Uh, so we managed to get a slot. It was quite a last-minute thing. We attended the weekend. It was during the weekend that a lot of topics uh, which we had never talked about, even when we knew each other in university, uh, like money, um, how do we manage our finances, how do we manage uh, our, our families, our respective families? Some of the values uh, that I, I had no idea he had some opinions about. So all this came about during our uh, Catholic Engage Encounter weekend. And we talked about uh, when, how to space our children and uh, how, how much money we will contribute to our families and things like that. Um, I'll let Alan share about how he met me and what other things that uh, he saw in me. But for me, what I found in him 
that made me feel that he was the ideal partner for me was uh, his simplicity, uh, his willingness to listen uh, to me and uh, not be not be not let, uh, accepting everything that I said because uh, I, I didn't know he had uh, strong opinions about many things, <laughs> uh, uh, but that made me respect him and respect uh, his uh, thought process and understand him better. Also because we both came from Catholic uh, family background, so our faith was a very strong uh, binding factor in making me realize that this is the kind of uh, husband I want uh, to spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> I'm all those things that she said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all those things she said. It's all, all true, absolutely true. Um, <laughs> But actually, for me, it's, it, it might sound a little bit uh, like how it would be in films. Uh, like Marie said, I, I mean, we met in the camp. Uh, I saw her in one of, the, uh, in one of our college activities. And when I saw her, it, I just told myself, this is the girl I would like to marry. Wow. So it, it was just that. There was no uh, fact-based or anything as, as such. It was just the fact that we were from the same college, we were from the same place, and I liked her. Uh, and but I didn't have the guts to go and tell her. So uh, I kept it to myself. But I, I, I recall um, saying a small prayer to myself that, you know, um, if I were really to marry someone, it would be like her. And it's just ob observing her during the, the, the activity, the way she was very simple, humble. Uh, she, was a, she was in a leadership role. <laughs> so obviously for me, it was like, would I actually be able to, you know, uh, date someone like her or get, even get married to her? Because I got to know later on that she was uh, even the leader in her in her university, etc. So um, I just told myself that that prayer, uh, and I kept on with it. Um, and then, like Marie shared, one time when she came home um, to to my brother's uh, birthday party, and my mum made a comment that um, she's a very nice girl. I, I quite like her, and that was kind of an affirmation for me to know that okay, I've thought right, <laughs> and I should continue pursuing it in some direction. But like Marie said. She came up to Singapore. I moved to Middle East after my university. And um, we just communicated as friends. But deep down in my heart, I still very much desired to, to get married to her. And uh, one day, as just part of uh, my trip back to India, I, met, I went to her house. And um, the question came up about her. And uh, I, I admitted to her parents and to her grandmother that, yes, if I were, to, if I were given the opportunity, I would love to marry her. Uh, I went back to Middle East uh, and, and then uh, yeah, I proposed to her for, over the phone <laughs> because we couldn't meet in, in person that time. And uh, I think at that time, Marie was still deciding, you know, whether as friends, how would we turn out to become husband and wife and life partners. And um, so I came here uh, and, and then we spent some time together and then we decided to go for the, uh, the, the our marriage preparation plans. But all along for me, it was always about, um, when I looked at her, it kind of gave me a very long-term vision that she was the one I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And something that sealed it for me was just the tagline of, of Catholic Engage Encounter, which is, thing is a day and marriage is a lifetime. So yeah, that, that's the Thank <laughs> I'd you. Like to share. Thank you. So um, you, you said earlier that you prayed for a wife like Marie, because you were, when you saw her, you fell desperately in love straight away. Yes. <laughs> and God answered your prayer. He gave you exactly Marie. <laughs> So that's thank you for sharing. Um, Actually, and, I yes. um, for Christian and I it was slightly yeah. different. We weren't uh, as lucky, if you want to call it that, that to you know find the one. Mm -hmm. uh, when we met, she was dating someone else, um, <laughs> and I don't have the the same chance as Marie to to, to win her over, <laughs> to make her <laughs> to make fall her. in love with that's you. That's right. Um, but it is, I think, a decision that we make every day, especially now that after we are married, that. Um, Although we don't really believe in the one, uh, it, is my, it is our choice or my choice that she is the one for me mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. And um, especially after marriage where this decision is, is harder to make <laughs> <laughs> for her, um, we, we try to, or rather we, we do this conscious um, decision making to love uh, each other more. To choose love to choose every love. day. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for bringing that out. I think that's very sound advice. It's very true as well for my marriage. Um, because I think a lot of times uh, when you're dating, uh, you're, you, you're more or less, you know, you're in that love bubble. Things are easy. Um, and then 
things kind of maybe fizzle a little bit, you know, when you get very familiar. And then uh, for myself, I found, um, I, of course, you know, I, like I mentioned, I, was, I had a crush on my husband, right? But we, of course, lost touch. And then we only got together properly um, when I was 20, 21. We got married early. I got married when I was 24. Um, and of course, I think maybe with age having something to do with it as well. I was very young, very idealistic as well. And I thought, oh, you know, I found the love of my life. I marry, I'm mar now marrying him, yay. But um, I think increasingly, we also faced um, issues together, you know, as we got to know each other more and more. Simple things like getting used to each other's families, getting used to the way um, they talk to each other at the table, for example, can be very different, even though from, for us as well, we're both from Catholic families. In fact, our families knew each other um, from church. But even then, when I first you know, went and saw his family, there was still a bit of culture shock. And then there's that extended family as well. Um, of course, uh, with things slightly more um, with as the years went by, I think things getting to know each other made things easier in some sense, but also as we progressed in our relationship, more questions came up uh, as we decided, should we get married? Uh, should we take the next step? Um, when he proposed, I was like, yes, okay. In fact, uh, Andrew and Christine were in uh, were studying in yeah. Australia when my husband, cause uh, my husband was uh, is friends with uh, Andrew first from secondary school, and um, basically he brought me to Australia as a surprise and he proposed there. I was really shocked by the way, but I said yes. And to be very honest, I think even during that time when I said yes, there was a lot. There were a lot of questions in my head still, you know. Um, and then I thought, okay, never mind. We'll just work it out along the way. Attending later on, attending engaged encounter helped tremendously because it allowed us that time, and I think it forced us to like talk about serious issues, things that we may not have dared to open up um, otherwise. Um, but I think when we did have the discussions, it taught us how to accept the other person, and I think that's important as well um, to yeah. really. Except because when you choose to marry a person, you are marrying everything about that person, not just what you select in your own head. So it, like what um, Andrew and Christine shared, um, it's, it's very much a choice. And, and in marriage, I think every day, ones that, you know how they say love is not a feeling, right? Love is a choice. Um, that's really true because there are days when like, I just want to strangle my husband and I'm sure there are days that he wants to strangle me as well but then, you know, we're both like <sighs> seething. Then we decide, okay, either time out for a while but we got to circle back and talk about it. Um, I think that has gotten better over the years. At first, I think we didn't talk about a lot of things and we just let a lot of things um, simmer under the undercurrent. It wasn't very healthy. And it went on until we had children. Eventually, we decided, okay, I th we went for another retreat and I think that really helped us to open up further. So I think that the spiritual growth of us as a couple also helped us in our relationship. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> so we're going to now move on to... Um, what was mentioned previously, which is also a very, very big hot topic in many lives of the couples that uh, we encounter at uh, CEE, and this is embracing the extended family. Now, when couples get engaged, one important thing that they should also know is that they'll be marrying someone um, who belongs to a family. Um, and in the same way, you belong to a family that is not familiar to your other half as well. And this journey as a couple um, is actually going to be a journey with each other's families as well, most of the time. Very rarely do we, especially in Asia, right, do we come across uh, people who are just very disconnected uh, with their families. Most of the time, uh, people, uh, men, women, you know, they, they have very deep connection with family. And a lot of time also, we find that many issues that couples face uh, stem from some sort of undercurrent issues with in-laws or even their own parents, for example. Um, one question we get is, how do we nurture our relationships with our in-laws in a life-giving manner? Now, when we use the term life-giving, 
uh, it actually means that you do when, to do something life giving means you do something uplifting for another without asking or expecting anything in return. So you do something life-giving, it uplifts that other person, and you don't expect any thanks or anything in return. Um, so the question again is, how do we nurture our relationships with our in-laws in a life-giving manner? Um, Andrew and Christine, what do you think? This part I know is recorded, so I'm going to be a bit more PC. <laughs> then they're going to put it online, my mother-in-law will watch. Anyway, <laughs> my mother-in-law uh, was a bit uh, protective. Um, it, it seemed that Christine and I were uh, the first in her family to get married, and Christine is, uh, sorry, and I was the, the first one taking away a daughter in that sense. Mm. So her, she was a bit uh, protective at the start, which made me feel a bit uh, uncomfortable or um, you know why am I facing so much roadblocks mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that um, but I chose to you know um, of course show respect to, to elders and seniors but more so that I didn't want to add additional stress uh, to Christine mm -hmm. in that relationship family is important to me and the both of us and I didn't want to cause more strain or any strain at all yeah so um I think Andrew was, uh, he was very... Okay. Um, I sorry, I forgot what I wanted to say. Uh, yes, so with my mom, uh, truly she was more protective. And also I was the first of my sisters to be in a serious long-term relationship. So I guess, you know, they also needed to warm up to the idea that eventually I was going to get married. Uh, we had differing views on when was the time to start looking for, for a house, when was the time to get married. Um, because what we thought was the right time, they, they have different ideas about it. Um, and I was also stressed because, you know, if this is someone that I love and someone I can see a future with, of course I would want um, my parents' blessings. Um, and that was also important to me. Fortunately, we were on the same page on that, and that's why he didn't give me, he didn't give me any grief. Um, uh, but because it's, it's my mother, right? So I felt that it was more... Uh, it was more, it would, it would be easier for me to help take the first step to initiate, well, I mean, to, to get, well, to help the situation improve, I suppose, um, because for him, it may, it may not go down too well. Mm. Um, but, I mean, after discussion and praying about it, and also I did pray for years, um, <laughs> we also realised that, okay, if there's more, of, for whatever misgivings or reservations my mother may have, um, regardless of what we think, you know, whether well-founded or not, um, perhaps the, the treat, the solution would be for there to be more opportunities for interaction between uh, Andrew and my family. Mm -hmm. uh, so she can observe firsthand, you know, what he's like, ascertain whether his intentions are true and genuine. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that did help um, over the It was the also years. very good that I got the support yeah. of the rest of her siblings and, and uh, father-in-law. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so that did help. Yeah, so they, um, they, they also helped to you know, speak with my mom or encourage her to be open to him coming for, I don't know, family events or like wedding dinners that we were invited to attend as a family. Mm. So it was a, it was a whole effort. <laughs> it was <laughs> a whole effort, yeah. But I think what, what we learned from, from it was that it's important. I mean, it was always important for us to protect our relationship, right? Just the two of us. Um, and it's easy to expect that when we say protect relationship, oh, we are thinking about protecting from external parties, right? You know, someone who may have an eye on Andrew as well as eye on me. But um, it, these sort of stresses that arise from uh, friction between us and our extended family, those are things to protect from as well. Mm. But at the end of the day, um, Andrew was always very firm, you know, to, we have to be loving uh, to our family no matter what, uh, regardless of the differing views and always um, I think he would lead or he would prompt us to pray about it and actually if you think about it these are people that are involved in their personalities they are beyond anyone's control you can't command a person to love another person mm -hmm. and ironically when I mean it's the best time to surrender uh, you know these issues to God because only he can in his own time in his own way he will make the path straight yeah. Amen. Yes. Thank you very much. I hear a lot about, um, I think, 
Christine being a buffer, a certain kind of buffer between Andrew and her family. And then it's great that you had the rest of your family who obviously liked Andrew and supported you guys as a couple and helped his image with your mom. Um, so when, when you nurtured and your relationship together, how did you um, maybe navigate um, certain other pressures that may have, like you mentioned, there are there may have there may have, there may be extra um, external pressures that uh, affect your relationship that may cause strain, you know. As a, and Ellen Marie, feel free to jump in as well if you have anything to add on this. I think uh, I need to swap my. So for us, uh, sorry, thanks. So uh, for Alan and myself, uh, our, although strangely our our marriage is an arranged marriage, uh, we do not have a very close relationship with both of our sides of our family. But uh, as having said that, Ellen always has uh, maintained a very cool and a very close uh, relationship with my side of the family, my parents, uh, my siblings. And for, for me as well, I'm quite close to his uh, extended family. He has a very big extended family. Uh, during our wedding, there were two bus loads which <laughs> attended the wedding. And there were like, uh, if you had to take family photographs with the Dinasio side, there were like four shots uh, of uh, pictures because they couldn't fit into one frame. <laughs> <laughs> Stitch them all together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had no idea he had such a big extended family. It came as a shock because uh, I had, I thought that it was just him, his brother, and his parents. But I didn't know that his mom's side there were nine siblings, mm. and all of them had like very big families. They had nine, eight children. So uh, that was a bit bit of a shocker for me. But the, having said that, his side of the family, the extended family, they're very very uh, f uh, nice to me. Uh, the, because uh, the, the the common factor being <laughs> my mother-in-law, <laughs> who who is a very strong personality and everybody's scared of her, so knowing that I'm her daughter-in-law sort of makes them feel uh, treat me much better. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually had an advantage for that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know actually. <laughs> I had no idea uh, what I was getting into. But uh, in all these years, despite our differences, right, when it's come to occasions where. Uh, his side of the family has had any uh, wedding or any birth in the family or any... My mother-in-law calls me. She'll ask me to be involved in the wedding preparation. She even asked us to be the godparents for my niece, uh, knowing that she, uh, I'm not her favorite. But the fact that she, she still reaches out to me, I know that uh, I have something in me that... Uh, she finds <laughs> uh, suits suits her uh, suits her liking, and I'm very grateful for that because uh, I've always uh, looked up to her. And it was actually when Avalan said that I met his family the first time when I went for his brother's wedding, is because I took a bunch of uh, yellow roses. I had no idea that it was her favorite color, <laughs> and uh, that. That made her like me so much, you know, and I always think that yellow is a, is my redeeming factor. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the best thing to win my mother-in-law is to give her anything in yellow, and she's very happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but having said that, um, I'm very uh, grateful that uh, God has put uh, our external family in our life because when we are away from them, uh, we do not have a support network here. But when our family is back in India, need any help, like when my parents are alone or uh, they need help, I can always call on his brother mm -hmm. to check on them. Or when his mom is not well, then there's somebody from our side of the family to go and check on him, That's check wonderful. on her, especially yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, there were times where we couldn't reach them mm. on the phone or we couldn't get in touch with them. So it was our siblings and our own uh, families who were able to help come to out there eight. That's great. I mean, the, the word nurture actually is so powerful, no? actually, because um, it all begins with us being nurtured by our parents. You know, then you have, so like Marie mentioned, I have a big family, and I always felt very nurtured uh, as I would travel different parts of India, uh, whether it's my aunt or my, uh, my mom's uh, brothers, etc. I always felt that, that feeling of being nurtured, that they treated me like their own son, like some, someone of their own. So I never ever felt that 
um, I was different uh, in in growing up. But when we get married, it's the same thing. Uh, we actually get get married, and then we have to nurture our relationship. We have to nurture each other. So to me, it was a very powerful thing to carry on uh, from that perspective when I came into marriage. And with that, I knew that I can't forget my mother. I can't forget my my uh, in-laws in the same way. Uh, she's coming from, her parents are giving her up. Um, and my care. So I need to make sure that I nurture. And that nurture has to be very holistic. It can't be just the two of us. Um, we begin to form a family, but we also have that extended family. So. Yeah. Um, that nurturing part had to extend and continue to work on it because it's never going to be, there's no such thing as perfect, actually, uh, in anything. So yes. it's always work in progress. That's true, yes. Yeah. I hear a lot of um, acceptance for both of you. I think um, you, obviously, there's, you know, there, there were issues at the start, um, and but it's always, like you said, a work in progress. And I think it's very similar to maybe many of us here in the room who, are, who also experience certain um, maybe disagreements or just, you know, can't see eye to eye on certain things. Um, but I hear, I mean, for both your sharing, Andrew and Christine and Ellen and Marie, I hear a lot of um, accepting and acceptance uh, of each other. And it's just the knowledge that um, this person that I choose also, in a sense, belongs to a family mm. that comes yes. with. So I want to add something. Yeah, sure. Because uh, my my mother-in-law is the one who raised her two sons mm. on her own for so many years. Yes. And the fact that I have a good husband, a good father to my children, a lot of it goes to the values she instilled in wow, him. Yes, yes. So how can I forget that? Very no matter good. how uh, her relationship is with me, because of what I have with me to share my life with, I cannot let that go. Yes. And I will love her wholeheartedly yes. for just that alone. For nurturing a good man to be a good husband to you. Yes. For his birthday, I will always remind him, call your mother. <laughs> you know? she gave Thank you birth for giving to birth to me. <laughs> yeah, she gave birth to you. Call her, you know. Give her the honor, you know. Well, I wish yeah. somebody would do that for my children. Call your mother <laughs> on your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> because when, when I treat my mother-in-law and my parents with respect and dignity and yes. love, I set that example for my children in future. Yes, right? and it's, uh, it's also being a face of Christ, right? To, yes. to the people around you and setting an example for your children yes. in that way. Yes. To, to love and respect your elders, even if we may not agree and even if we just have different thinking or, you know, live yes. our lives a bit differently, but yes. it's really just choosing to love again. Yes, that choose, cho cho decision to love decision every to love. time, you know, yes. that, that is important. Thank you so much, Ellen and Marie. Um, now we're going to be moving on to the next uh, topic, which is God in your marriage, which is also very interlinked uh, in whatever, into whatever we uh, have been talking about. And I think that, well, as far as Catholic marriages go, um, we cannot separate the God factor from our marriage. In fact, we cannot separate the God factor in our daily lives because God's everywhere. He's here right now with each of us, in us, within us, around us, you know, before us. Um, so basically, for this topic, God being in marriage, how um, is a person's faith, you know, being deeply uh, personal, whether Catholic, Christian, other faiths, how 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 does um, religion basically and 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 God basically uh, bring the teachings and values into marriage? And here, of course, we're talking about the Catholic values. We're talking about um, the God we believe in as Catholics, and how does it re influence relationship between spouse and bringing up children? Um, later on, we will cover a little bit on um, interfaith marriages as well, couples from different faiths. But basically, questions often come up about how do we do this? How do we um, make sure that God is present in our marriage, firstly? And how do we ma make sure that you know we impart the values to our children, uh, to our family? Um, one of the most frequent questions we receive during a weekend is, how do we bridge the cultural and faith differences between them and their families if they come from different religious backgrounds. 
Um, Andrew and Christine, would you be able to share a little bit on this uh, from the insights that you have gained? Yeah, of course. Um, and I think, you know, you separated the interfaith from the Catholic couples and Catholic marriages, but actually, in even in Catholic marriages, there are differing levels of faith, like laps Catholic or yes. Sunday Catholics or two times Catholic, only attend two times two a times year. Catholic, la. Yeah. Uh, Easter and Christmas. <laughs> um, and for us also, even in our lives now, our faith levels um, uh, always on a roller coaster. And, you know, maybe now a bit higher. Expecting the drop soon. I don't Actually, know. Actually, what I said, I think now is a bit closer. But he said roller coaster, so maybe we'll have a chat <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think um, individually, we go back to the basics, and we need to again decide to love God first and love in God's love, especially for my brother-in-law. And um, can you take that part out, please? <laughs> uh, and once we have that first uh, relationship with, with God, then it's easier to work as a team. So that's the, the very basic baseline. So um, if one of us, for example, if I'm on a roller coaster and she's closer, <laughs> <laughs> then Christine is the one that uh, encourages us to pray a bit more. Mm. Uh, and that has helped me. And of course, we take turns depending on the situation and uh, work stress or, or whatever yeah. that we're in. Um, I was going to say that the how to have God in our marriage is actually to set the foundations right, to have God also present in your dating phase. Mm. Um, I felt that that uh, helped uh, our relationship grow in the right direction, hit the right direction as always we were dating. Uh, when we were... Uh, I think Andrew and I, you know, on our first date, uh, he accosted me with so many questions. Uh, what are my views? Uh, family and da da. And, and then I think he I was think interviewing I'll, you. Yeah, I was interviewing you. It was an interview along. I thought it was going to be a romantic walk by the river bank. <laughs> but it was an interview under an umbrella. And then it cannot run, right? First date, someone. <laughs> but anyway, it was good to, to get our expectations out of the way. Um, but one of the things that we did discuss was. Uh, we did ask each other about was our spiritual lives, you know, where we were. And to be very honest, at the time, I think I was a bit more lukewarm than now. Um, but we both agreed that, you know, we wanted to grow closer to, do, to God. And the question was how, was just how to, how to get there, right? And, and at that time, uh, we were university students. Uh, you know, we were attend mass. Uh, we, we decided, okay, we attend mass regularly. La, don't skip for no good reason, right? Mm. Um, but Andrew also took the bolder step to initiate praying together, which mm. took, which for me took a while to get used to. And when I say pray together, um, I don't think it was praying in person, but because we were living in uh, separate residences, right? So maybe we would just pray on the phone mm -hmm. uh, together. And praying for me already, I feel is very personal. So to pray together as a couple, to hear what he's praying, and for him to hear what I was going to pray um, made me feel uncomfortable. Uh, but um, I think because it was something that we agreed, you know, could help us grow closer to God, then, of course, we had to, we followed through. La. And that has helped. I mean, that, that sort of um, practice has continued with us to today in our marriage. Not that we do it every day, but uh, we try to every day. And also, especially when we know that the other person is going through a very trying time. Um, you know, I can pray for him without him having to be present. I just let him know, okay, and I pray for you today. I hope you have a good afternoon. God bless. I'll see you later. Uh, simple things like that. Um, and the other thing that I also wanted to share was, uh, he he's a very brave man. Uh. He said, you know, when we were when we at the early days of our relationship, when we were there were still a lot more to find out about each other. <laughs> there were some um, quarrels along the way. Andrew said, okay, I have a good idea. You know, when we get angry. What we're going to do is we're going to take a time out and then uh, one of us will initiate praying, right? So we'll hold hands and we'll pray, you know, for peace and for wisdom and for patience and understanding and listen and all that. So I was like, oh, you know, that's very good. Lah. It didn't last very long. Yeah, well, it didn't last very long. So we did try at the beginning, right? Um, but it was difficult to consistently implement. And then I remember Andrew asked me once, right? Because like, I didn't initiate and then he didn't initiate. Then he asked me after things had calmed down. Uh, he said, um, you know, we had agreed, right, to hold hands and then to pray. <laughs> so how come you didn't, you didn't pray? So I said, you didn't pray what? Then I prayed. So it was, it was not, um, it was very good, uh, <laughs> ideal. But um, we also, this is just an example of how we have to 
I think we work together to find out what works for us and you won't know until you try. Mm. So at least we tried that it's like okay, it didn't work, then we just modify lah, you know, as we go along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, this is something that uh, we wanted to That's okay. This was something that we wanted to kind of uh, implement in our own families, our own, mm. as in our own family moving forward, uh, our own traditions, our own practices, and how best to, you know, be, be the face of Christ if we have children and, and, yes. and whatnot. Mm. To start as a couple, praying yeah. together. And I think it's always a... I mean, like, like you said, Christine, start, starting when you are angry with each other can be very idealistic. But if you manage to do it, it might actually work wonders. Um, for myself and my husband, we were always very separate in prayer. Uh, we had very... We used to think that, oh yeah, no need to go to church on Sunday. Anyway... You know, like, my relationship with God is very personal, what, right? So, why do I need to go to church to show everybody that I'm a good Catholic? That's what we used to think. So, okay lah, we just, you know, fumble through life like this. And then, when we quarrel, sometimes it gets really, really nasty, you know. We say things, sometimes we regret immediately, but cannot take back, you know. Um, but then, eventually, I think when we grew spiritually, and we learned um, certain tools to help us, as a couple, tools that actually we learn, not actually to become a better couple, but actually just to help us form a better relationship with God. I realized that the moment um, we did that, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but the moment Mervyn and I focused our lives more on God, everything else just kind of click, 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 just like fell into place. Um, We became better for one another. We became better parents. I think almost overnight, friends, family, saw a difference in the way we were with each other as well. Um, and sometimes they would, you know, mention things like, you hey, know, these are very loving. Ah. And it's just like, you know, things that I hardly thought twice about. Like, mm, last time never hold hands. Last time, like, you know, everything's just like bothering about children. And then like, your husband don't eat, never mind. I just feed my children first, right? Or like, oh, wife is behind carrying one million bags, but then I'm just walking in ahead because I'm texting on the phone and I got business to deal with. So like, never mind, lah, wife deal with kids and one million bags, never mind. Um, so, but, but, but when we again grew spiritually and we became closer to God, we focused our attention on, okay, we have to pray and we have to try and be better Catholics and we need to love God more. I think in somehow we grew to love each other more as well because it taught us in, I don't know, no, God's really wonderful, I have to say. La. He, is, he, he just taught us how to be better towards each other as well. In loving him, we also loved each other more. And then we, we learn to love our children more. We learn to love our parents more. In-laws, parents, you know, brothers, sisters-in-law. Um, and, and I think overall, it was just suddenly our lives changed, you know, and, and really for the better. So, Ellen and Maria, I wanted to ask you, because I know you um, have a sister, in India, who got married, and, and she, um, or is it a brother, a brother, a brother in India, and then got married to a lady who was Hindu at first, right? Can you share a little bit more on that, about how they managed that transition, or how they managed the relationship at first? So, my younger brother, so my younger brother actually um, married a Hindu girl, um, but before that, there was there was just the necessity because of my big, large family, like you mentioned. They would all say, you know, why is he marrying outside? So that was a big challenge for him. And uh, I think it, it just came as a blessing that um, his wife now decided to journey and do the RCIA. Um, and my brother never actually forced or put it as a condition in the marriage. Mm-hmm. She just decided to do it because he was just living the faith every day. And that, I think, definitely helped. Um, so she joined the RCA and she converted and uh, the wedding was a Catholic wedding. With, uh, we had the whole uh, uh, service, etc. What happened was also, I think, important after the marriage because um, we also felt that she could have done it just to make everyone happy because of, of the pressure that she would have had, you know, meeting my extended family members, my mother, etc. Um, but what happened was my brother actually allowed her to continue the, the flexibility of falling back sometimes 
because obviously she comes from a big family as well, uh, and they've been Hindus since their birth as well. So um, off and on, she would go back, you know, to be with her parents and you know do their own Hindu service, etc. But somehow over the period of time, I asked my brother one day, you know, do you actually involve her? She says that no, I don't ask, I don't force her to come to church with me. Um, I just go to church, but I, I let her know that I'm going to church, and if she wants to come, she can come along. And that's how he's kept it all the all along. And as of now, today, you know, when we have a rosary sh session that we do remotely, she will join and she will be there throughout. The, mm -hmm. They have a they have a three year old daughter now. Um, and I find the same thing. You know, the question was, what would that girl end up choosing? Yes, and yes. at this point in time, I find both the parents very accommodating in the way how they're exposing them. Obviously, my sister-in-law is very much lean towards the Catholic faith uh, mm -hmm. in terms of you know attending service and and saying the rosary etc at mm -hmm. home, but even for the for the child when she engages with her grandparents or or her own uncle and, and aunt uh, from the mother's side, um, she's found to just mingle and do things. There's no restriction that you can't do this or you can't mm -hmm. participate in this Hindu service because you're not. Uh, so I find that that is important because obviously you have to accept that there are some things that you really cannot change just by enforcing things, but just allowing the flow of it. But I find that they are really prayerful in the way how they lead their daily lives. And that's wonderful, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Marie wants to add. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so for Fa'al and myself, because we mm -hmm. are godparents for our niece, yeah. um, uh, most of her faith formation comes from us. Mm. And uh, we were there for her baptism. And we've always, uh, they came here uh, a year before the pandemic, and they spent the whole June holidays with us. We took them visiting churches, and she would go to all the statues, and she'll go and kiss them. <laughs> and yeah, so so uh, I feel that the way we live our faith, mm -hmm. and uh, how Alan's brother lives his faith, will encourage his spouse uh, to lean towards our faith as well. We, yeah. we are not the ones who will, uh, force them. It's just the way we live, our values and our, our own beliefs. Yes, that's what will help them. Yes. So I, I mean, from whatever you have shared, I think I hear a lot of, basically, not putting pressure on the person. And, and and you know sometimes when you put pressure on a person, things can can get a bit ugly. A person might even turn the other way and run off because they get a bit scared off. You know. But um, basically living by example and living out the faith and being a good person and being the face of Christ and that's what draws them in, right? Yeah, so that's really wonderful. Thank you for very much for sharing. Um, just a gentle reminder, if you have any questions, you can scan the QR code and just type in. Um, uh, we will try and answer your questions during our Q&A session at the end. Um, okay, so now we are going to talk about finance in marriage and this is a big topic. Um, in fact, the quite, you know, uh, recently I saw the latest statistics is that um, financial issues is actually uh, the one of the top, if not the top, um, issue that brings about divorce. Right, Christine? Christine's the lawyer. Yes, I confirm <laughs> that and in laws, but uh, that and in laws, oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'll let actually finish. Then I'll clarify. Oh. It's not the in laws who caused the breakdown per se. <laughs> sure. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um financial, the financial aspect in marriage and money or the need for money is such a large part of uh you know building a family, our daily lives. We work, we plan, we save, we spend, and many times we worry about money, especially for couples who are planning a wedding. Um, money is a hot topic, you know. In Singapore, weddings are expensive. Whether you want a small one or a big, great one, you know, it's, it's, it costs money. And it's, it's something we all need to save for, talk about, and plan for. So, Christine and Andrew, as a relatively new couple, a newly wed couple, would you be able to share with us what your financial narrative was like as you prepared for your wedding? I think as we were preparing for the wedding, um, Andrew was already flying. Uh, he was already cabin crew with SIA. So he had a steady income. And I think I was just, I was maybe like two or three years um, after completion or training. So I, I also had... Uh, sitting, sitting, income. But the two of us, I suppose, we were still trying to build our savings as we go. And um, for us, it was it was a pretty um, scary time because there would be outflow for the wedding, and then there will also be very quick outflow for the resale flat that we were planning to buy. And the reality was, 
we were just so busy and maybe we didn't prioritize trying to apply for BTO. Um, that's why when the time came, we were like, okay, we have to get a we have to get a resale flat now, um, and then the wedding would follow soon after. So that was what we were facing. And as Andrew mentioned earlier, um, the t timing wise, he was also going to close his business. Uh, so that would mean, you know, he needed, he was really starting to for alternative sources of income, planning what to do for his next business and so on. Um, and how we managed was, I think we, we talked at length about what expenses were important, what was, you know, good to have, what um, was a luxury. And this applied to both, um, uh, yeah, yeah, this applied mainly for, for the wedding. Uh, yep. And then we also, I think maybe we, there were things that we agreed upon didn't really matter to us. So I suppose in summary, we, we just, we were pretty open with each other. We discussed matters, we tried to prioritize what's important. And um, yeah, sorry, work within a budget is very important. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me also as a, a equal partner in the relationship, uh, I know that Christine had, had her savings and I wanted to pay debtors and um, had less savings in general. Um, so I also had maybe self-implied pressure to mm. catch up with the savings and contribute equally um, to the wedding or to the marriage uh, as well. And um, it was difficult, but we had that conversation, ego aside and all. And I think that uh, what Chris Christine mentioned, yes, th those were the practical steps that we took. Yes. Um, but at the, at the very baseline, at the start, we uh, surrendered this portion, the finance portion to God and uh, everything kind of fell in place. So the resale HDB that we were looking at first was, uh, you know, out of budget. Mm. Um, and then we didn't press, I think everyone needs to, to make some money. We didn't press for them to, to lower the, the price. Uh, but within the same week, um, they called, the, the seller's agent called us back and said they had dropped 80K. Wow. Um, and that was just nice for our budget with all the you know, other grants and whatnot. Wonderful. Yeah, and this was the first house that, that we, we saw and liked, and yeah. And then it was yours. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. And just wanted to ask, how, how did you, I mean, with financial planning and, you know, money being a very practical daily life topic, right? How did your faith come into play when you make decisions on, um, about all this? I think it was, I think we were always praying for, um, for, I mean, when we disagreed on what to spend on, then there'll be unhappiness. Um, but we would we would pray um, for discernment on whether or not on how to how to work through this issue mm. because um, I think it wasn't always clear. Yeah. Uh, but we really needed to understand what was important to the other person. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you want to elaborate? So again, like basically being quite life-giving again and being very open in your communication and facing whatever, I mean, I wouldn't say challenges, but whatever uncertainties, you know, financial yes. uncertainties you faced um, together as a couple and being united, right? Yeah, because I think at the, for us, I mean, nothing was more important. I mean, at the end of the day, we are going to marry yeah. each other. There shouldn't be anything material that's more important. Yes. Than our union. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think that helped to guide us. Um, perhaps maybe... After a few months of quarrelling, like you know, it took us some time <laughs> to realize that as well. Yeah. yeah, well, it's true. I think that it's very common, right, for um, couples preparing for marriage to be very easily swept away by the whole planning. And then I want, you know, I mean, I remember being a very young bride and not much money mm -hmm. um, because I was really like, you know, just furious out of uni, hardly worked a couple of years. But then, you know, he proposed, and then we're like, okay lah, you know, uh, just go get married. Um, but then we realized after a while that. Okay, we wanted a wedding that um, was more for our parents than for ourselves. So we both agreed on that. We said, okay, we want to celebrate because we both are the first in our families to get married. Um, it's important to our parents and we just wanted them to, you know, be able to celebrate us and of course us celebrate with them and just have them invite all their friends of course all pre-COVID 10 years ago mm. um, so at the end it was a really wonderful uh, wedding party, you know, um, but there was a, quite a lot of stress, I think, planning for it because we were so young, we didn't have much savings, but we were going to have, like, I think, 360 people at our wedding. Um, 
we thankfully uh, our parents were, were very generous with us. We didn't ask of them, but they offered and they said, okay, you know what? We can fund you first, you know, the deposit that you need for your hotel. And they were like, Okay, thank you. And then when we collect our ang pao, the, the, that night we count our ang pao, the next day we just deposit in the bank and oh, it goes back to our parents, right? Um, but I think at the, during the planning phase, I was really stressed because I was like, I don't know how much money we're going to be able to fork out for this. I don't know how much money we're going to be left with after our wedding. Am I going to have to like, I don't know, eat grass after that for the rest of my life. But it was really real issues, I think, um, during that time. And I think that money can be quite an ugly topic as well. Um, and even for, you know, for a married couple already who is planning for children, again, that's the next step that requires money, right? I mean, in Singapore, going to the hospital costs money and bringing up a child costs money and everything, basically, right? Um, how, Ellen and Marie, did you plan for this? Like, when you had your family, um, how did you... Uh, weave your financial narrative into your relationship? So for Al and myself, uh, uh, from, from the very early days already, mm -hmm. we've already, uh, we were just bare minimum. Yeah. Uh, we, we didn't have any savings at the time, and we were both renting a, a room actually before when we got married, and we didn't have a house of our own. Um, for our wedding also, similar to you, it was more for our parents. Yeah. We let them do everything. We only were involved in the church ser service. We, were, we only did the selection of the readings, the choir hymns, and who will do what. Everything else was left to yeah. them. And so finances were, were there, was, was in, were important, always is still important, but uh, we didn't put a lot of um, uh, stress on it. Because, so for us, we, got, we were married very young also. We got married when we were 25. And uh, when we had our first son, um, honestly speaking, we were very fortunate that that's the year that the government came out with the baby bonus scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so it helped a lot. Um, uh, the the gynae expenses were also very expensive. Um, uh, and all my pregnancies were very complicated. Mm, yeah. uh, so uh, just so happened that one of our colleagues recommended this uh, gynae to us at Thompson Medical. and. Uh, he, for some reason, he reduced his uh, consultation. I won't say which doctor, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he was very, very kind. Uh, he reduced his consultation by half for us. And then uh, at that time, the first my first child, right, I only paid, uh, I only topped up $70 when I got discharged. Oh, wow. Because for the everything was covered. <laughs> the MediSafe covered everything. So I didn't think that, oh, it was going to be so yeah. so affordable. Yeah. But my second child, I topped up 1300 mm -hmm. And the third child, more than 8000 So the inflation God, rate kept God, going. God also knew, like, okay, at this stage, you need this. And then at this stage, okay, like, they can yeah. afford it. <laughs> so, so for savings-wise, I was... Um, for, for our first child, right, we didn't really have any money to buy the, the crib or the pram or anything. So our co we, we got a lot of gift vouchers from our colleagues. Mm -hmm. So we bought that. At that time, both Alan and myself were working in a, in a restaurant company. We had an American boss. And he was uh, very, very uh, kind. He gave us like seven boxes of clothes from infancy to seven years of age. And one box for each year. One box for each year. <laughs> all branded clothes. <laughs> like, you know, and we were like very normal jeans. The teacher and our child was always in branded gap <laughs> and branded clothes like that. So I felt like Providence played a very important part in our planning. Yeah, and uh, uh, we never really chased after money. Mm. But whenever we needed it, it just came at the right time. Wow, yeah. So God took care of you. Yeah, and gave in his time when, when, he, when he saw you needed. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so basically now in with, with um, you know, finance being a, a really um, practical thing, but then you were talking about how, you know, Providence played such a big part in your story, um, your faith basically. So did you, um, was it a constant prayer for, for God to provide? How did you uh, weave your faith into to this? So we... Um Marie and myself both uh, came up, came through very traditional families who obviously uh, we grew up saying prayers at home and all mm -hmm. that. And 
we did Navinas, et cetera. So that yeah. continued with us. And one of the places we used to go, I remember, uh, was to Navina Church, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, really go on our knees, pray fervently, ask for those, pro ask for pro providence, ask for the gift of faith and the, just the gift to persevere through whatever we could, you know, endure. Uh, we, we had very small jobs at that time. Uh, like we shared, we didn't have uh, savings, but a huge amount of faith. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> a huge amount of faith in God and a huge amount of faith in each other. Just knowing that we will get this through together as as yes. a team, as as a couple, yes. uh, and just knowing that you know we also had a whole lot of uh, community. That time we had just started to you know engage with the Catholic mm -hmm. Engage Encounter, and that community was also a big support for us in terms of you know praying for us, um, sometimes coming over to our place, yeah. providing us some guidance, and that was just God's way of blessing us. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So it's just it's not just about money, right? But it's about also the support that you saw and people being the face of Christ to you and giving you that support. And I think I also hear um, quite a bit of um, humility. The humil you need you need right that kind of humility to ask for help. Like okay, I I don't I'm struggling right now. I don't see um, a way we might be able to afford this and then you pray and you say please I need help and then when help comes like you said your boss right he gave you hand me downs and you were humble enough to say okay you know no problem because I I, I know some people who are like oh, no 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 need la, no need la, no thank you no thank you you know but then you you accept it and I think that also um, shows that you know you had the humility to accept help when help came um, and really I think your story is a, a, a one of providence right. So thank you, thank you, Ellen and Marie. Um, and one of the another another very um, common question that couples ask us is, how much discussion do you think couples need to put into financial considerations, um, and how can we do this with God still being in the center of it all? You know, and would anyone like to comment or give advice on this? Yeah, so uh, I think it it all depends on on what you have and spending within your means. Mm -hmm. To tie it back to faith is is really depending on on God's timing, like uh, Ellen Marie and for both of us for our HDP. Uh, I can't really say you know set aside how much, especially in in this new new era of COVID. It it's yeah. different from what we went through. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you guys can share as well. You have the link to the Q and A if you wanna like put in your comments for this part and help each other with with a more I don't know relevant answer in this in this COVID climate. Then then please do it. Not too sure how to answer this question anymore, actually. <laughs> All right, Sorry. no worries. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um. So again, um, QR codes here. If you have any questions, just feel free. Uh, they they don't need to put their names down, right? Uh, Philip. Yeah. So anonymous. Don't worry. We're not gonna say. Came from this person, so don't worry, okay? Don't be shy. All right, so we're going to Your mother-in-law will never know. Yeah, your mother-in-law will know. <laughs> All right, finally, we are moving on to a very big topic, which is accepting the gift of children. Um, having children, you know, is a really large part of becoming a family. Um, and when we get married in a Catholic church... Um, as part of our vows, we say that we will openly accept the gift of children from God. Increasingly, couples are wondering if they can have a choice about whether or not to have children. And many couples talk about this huge decision in the run-up to marriage. Um, and it's definitely an important decision to have. That's why in our um, Engage Encounter Weekend, it's one of the topics that we talk about in depth, you know, because we need to... Um, I think it's important that couples are on the same page when it comes to, do I want children? Do I not want children? And um, some couples, in talking about their preferences about having children, cannot seem to see eye to eye about this. Maybe one partner wants children, the other does not, and oftentimes this may come as a surprise to the couple, uh, to the couples, you know, who think that all along, like, everything's fine, and then one day we ask this very simple question, and then they're like, oh dear, like, how do we go forward, you know? Um, but how can couples come to a decision as huge as this? Ellen and Marie, would you care to share about your journey about become, uh, um, to becoming parents? Thank you, Ashley. So the for us, 
uh, when we did our weekend as a young couple before marriage, we never really thought of when or what or how many kids to have. We did talk about it, but it was not like uh, going to be, oh, we're going to get married and have our first child at this month. Or <laughs> like, so it, we thought that we, we, since we had never gone through the dating process, we will give each other the time and we'll get to know each other for two, three years, and then we'll think of our first child. But it just so happened that uh, we conceived our first child within the first year of our marriage. Um, but um, because of a lot of work stress and not no no family support here, um, we lost that child uh, due to a miscarriage. And um, then subsequently, when we had that loss, uh, both of us experienced uh, so much grief that we felt that we didn't want to wait three years. Yes. We wanted to have our child in soon. But... God was not uh, uh, willing to bless us yet, and we waited three years to get our first born. So in that time, what happened was that uh, we thought that maybe we wouldn't be able to have a kid because I'd had three miscarriages, I had a tumor removed, okay. and we thought that, okay, maybe we should just um, have a fur baby. <laughs> and so we uh, adopted our first dog, uh, Tasha, and uh, she, uh, so after we got her in uh, April, uh, in June, I conceived my first child. Wow. And this was quite close after my tumor operation. So mm. the doctor was very uh, worried yep. and told us that you have to be very careful because your wound is not healed. Okay. And because of our previous history of miscarriages, yes. we were both very careful to uh, throughout the pregnancy. And we had to, I had to be on bed rest for a long time. I had this condition that uh, I had excessive saliva. Mm. I cannot talk two sentences without my mouth filling up with saliva. Yes. So, and we had no car in those days, so we took MRT and bus everywhere to work. I had a big plastic bag and a tissue toilet roll <laughs> in my hand all the time. People in the MRT would look at me like, oh my God, what is this woman? <laughs> but this plastic bag and then such tissue roll. It was but a symptom of your pregnancy. Yeah, it was. It was I, one in 10,000. Yes. I'm so blessed, you know. <laughs> One in 10,000 have this condition, right? And my, when I was going to give birth to my first child, my only question to the doctor was, am I going to have this for life? <laughs> okay, the baby will be born, I know, but <laughs> will this go away? <laughs> right? So, providence and our fear of having lost a child, yes. somehow also because of this condition, mm -hmm. I, my, my pregnancy was not one of those uh, very happy-go-lucky experiences, but... God gave us this perfect child mm -hmm. with ten hand, ten fingers, ten toes, two perfect ears, one nose, <laughs> a head full of He's hair. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we only had one of our very good friends who came during the delivery, and she said that, "Oh, you've done so well. Like I feel like I've got, I've got a reward, you know. <laughs> like I got, a, I won a prize like that." She said, "He." He was born like his hair was combed. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone combing inside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I don't know why. All these years, right, I was like so afraid of carrying other people's children. Mm. I don't like to carry babies. When I see couples in the plane with babies, I ask the flight attendant, can you give me a seat far away? <laughs> like, you know, I was like that, no. And yet when we had our first one, I couldn't let him go. Yeah. Like he was always, I would always want to be around him. Yes. Yeah, so the same thing happened with our second child. Uh, she came quite close. Because of our previous experiences, we didn't do any planning. Mm. We just uh, went with the flow, and with, within nine months of uh, having the first child, we conceived our second one. Yeah. And then uh, she, w she also, we had complications with her. And then, but the two children grew up like twins because they were only like a few months apart. Yeah. And uh, God... Whatever was bought for our first one was used for the second one. We didn't have to buy extra. Like, you know, it was not like spending a lot of money. Babies don't need a lot of money. They just need a lot of care and love. Yeah, mm -hmm. At that stage, not, no. And Singapore education is also very affordable, yes. you know. So, I've, honestly speaking, my only expenses happen after they became teenagers, when you have to buy them phones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just a few things to add. I mean, yeah. the, the thing is that I know in Singapore, generally, children are looked at as a big cost. And mm. I think if you stop looking at the cost and look at, you know, the joy and the love that they bring, yes. 
uh, it's become so so meaningful. Of course, you'll have days that are not not that great. Yeah. Uh, but to know that uh, they are just right after you, right? Yeah. So and and they're going to continue with you. It's such a beautiful thing to have to have. Uh, and yeah. life has just so much more meaning and purpose when you have children. Uh, yes. Yes. And for you, I mean, you know, when you were planning for a child, maybe, you know, later on, you know, you waited a bit and then when you wanted, you know, then you lost your child and then you, but you hung on to that, that faith and you had blessed two children within two years and then another one, how many years later? Six years later, so now you have three beautiful children. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a story of faith as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, for myself also, I think when it comes to children, I have two, two daughters. One is seven, one is one. The reason why there's a huge gap is because um, uh, we also had many losses. I, I've, I've, I've had six miscarriages. Um, and each of them, as painful as, you know, the, as if it's the first loss, you know, none of them were easy. Um, but the same, I think, like you, I... We, we had it planned, you know, we said, okay, we'll get married and then engaged for two years, married, and then two years later, we're going to have our first child and then later on, uh, wait two years and then have a second child, but it didn't happen that way, you know. Um, and basically, once things started going the way it did, um, I lost my first child, I, the first pregnancy I lost. Second pregnancy was my daughter, my first daughter, Caitlin, um, it was very difficult as well. I bled so much throughout my pregnancy, threatened miscarriage twice, had to go to a hospital and stay there and then cannot move and cannot work and basically like that. And then followed after that, five more. I tried really hard. Uh, firstly, it's, it, was, it's, it was difficult for us to get pregnant because I have um, fertility issues, you know, that I didn't know about until, of course, when we were trying for babies, then we were like, hmm, what's going on here? Then we go for a check and like, okay, you know, this is going on. So not easy, but I think it also made the losses a little bit harder because in the first place, not easy for me to conceive. And yeah. I had to take medicine and basically feel sick all the time. And during my, pregnancy, my second pregnancy also um, was quite a miracle because I believe <laughs> very strongly that um, God gave me my second child uh, really... I know all children are gifts, but he gave me this child as a certain reminder of his grace. Um, her name is Caroline. I gave birth to her last year. And actually, when uh, we were we were at a point where I thought, okay, I'm not going to have children already. I don't think I can have, you know. That's why I got two dogs, right? But then... Um, uh, but one day, after I attended a retreat, um, this is the CER retreat, um, um, and, and I, 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 was, I was just prompted to do a St. Jude's Novena, so I did it. And on the seventh day, I haven't finished the Novena, which is nine days. On the seventh day, I tested positive, pregnant. And I was like, hmm, because I was praying, you know, for a child. And I was praying the St. Jude's um, Novena. And I was pretty uncertain because so many times I test positive but then a few weeks later I lose the baby or even a few months later and then I have to go for an operation to you know um, so it was hard so at first I was like okay okay I'm I don't dare to be happy I don't dare to tell many people so I just told very close friends and family to to you know pray please pray for us so they pray and then this time so many people just said you know what Ash like don't worry God is healing you. God will take care of it. Don't worry. And so many times I got this message from random people. I even had a friend call me and say, Hey Ash, you know what? I have an aunt who, and we were just saying family prayer, right? And then I prayed for you. And then she just told me, tell your friend, don't worry. God is healing her. And he, he, called, he called to tell me. And I was like, okay, tell your aunt, thank you. And at that point, I was just like, really? You know? But true enough, God really was true. And he he um, carried me through this pregnancy and I, one night, I thought I had reached my second trimester. 13th week going 14th week. Okay, safe. Yes, safe already, right? Because once you reach your second trimester, the chances of miscarriage goes down like by a lot. Like, you know, 95% safe. On the night, that very night, I was just like lying in bed, watching a movie with my husband. My first daughter was asleep in her room. Just watching a movie, you know. Suddenly, I felt a 
gush of liquid. And I thought, have I lost control of my bladder? So I opened the sheets and I looked, and I was sitting in a huge pool of blood. And I just looked at my husband, and he looked at me, and he, of course, was shocked, but he didn't say anything. And he just helped me out of bed, and we were hobbling to the toilet, blood everywhere. And I just sat on the toilet bowl, and I just thought, okay, I think that's it. Lah. You know, there's so, much, there's so much blood, it cannot be possible that this baby is still alive. But my husband said, I think you don't worry. I just have this really strong feeling and this sense of peace. Baby is okay. So I just looked at him. I didn't dare to agree with him. I didn't dare to like, say anything. I just nodded and then I just cleaned myself up. He helped me and helped me back to bed. So we didn't rush to the hospital because we were actually due for a gynae checkup the, next, the very next day. So he asked me, do you want to go to the hospital? And I said, mm, I think no need. Lah. We just stay. Um, anyway, what are you going to do? I thought they're just going to wheel me in, check me and say, sorry, baby's gone. So that was on my mind. But he said, don't worry. I have a good feeling about this. And I was like, but all my other five, you know, same thing. But, you know, so we went in the next morning to the doctor's office. I was trembling as I stepped onto the, the bed to be checked. And I was very ready for the doctor to just scan. And as with all my other pregnancies, tell me, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we cannot find a heartbeat. I was very prepared for that. And, I, and, he, and, and Mervyn was gripping my hand. And he, he, before the gynae scan, he just said, have faith, have faith. And then in my head, actually, I was thinking, I'm trying to, I'm trying really hard, but I don't think this is going to work. Then suddenly I hear, do, 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 And I just cried because there was my baby and there was a heartbeat. And the gynae just like, you, you bled so much last night, but your baby is still okay. And then explain to me what was going on. Apparently, I had a hemorrhage in my womb for no apparent reason. And um, I just had to rest. Baby was okay, and I carried her to term. And to me, after going through all that I went through, it was really, really like a, a miracle. Yeah. So I think that when, I think when it comes to accepting children, for me personally, Yes, I will have as many as you want me to have, God, because, you know, maybe it's because it's so hard for me. Um, but to me, each child is really a gift. And what I learned later on um, through the Pieta group, which is a community of parents who have lost children, whether through miscarriage or even children who have lived before and then died, um, they actually said, you know, you can name your babies. And I went for a Pieta mass and at the cathedral um, before COVID, and we prayed for our babies. And actually... Yeah, I mean, long story short, God gave me a vision. I cannot even begin to explain this, but he gave me a vision and he allowed me time with my children and he showed them to me in heaven. I can't even like really put this in words, but he did. And uh, uh, I think that, that sealed my faith for me, like really sealed my faith for me. Yeah, so for, for when it comes to children, I think that we can plan and plan and plan as much as we want, but sometimes... God, I don't know. I mean, I, until this day, right, I don't know why he took away our babies, right? We, we don't know why. But what I know is that every one of those lives was, a, was alive. And now they are lives in heaven. They are alive in heaven, right? And uh, I'm just waiting uh, one day to be reunited. So I was joking with a friend who also has two children. And then she was like, I, uh, Ash, very busy, you know, with two children. From, two, from one child to two children, now very busy, you know? I said, yeah. But I think actually maybe when I go to heaven, I'll be very busy, you know, because I got eight. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ashley, for sharing in that testimony. Uh, it's very heartening. And Thank you for that sharing. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Um, I didn't expect to share that today, actually. And um, Okay, so uh, now we've actually come to our Q&A time. So we're just going to move into one of the questions. Sorry, I think I talked too much in my mic, no more battery. <laughs> okay, um, we'll just have uh, one question come up, which is, as a couple, how do we pray more regularly? Um, Andrew and Christine, would you like to take that one? I think, as with everything, there needs to be some effort at planning um, 
for Andrew and I, it's in the morning. And, sorry, it's in the morning and the and before bed. But depending on our schedules, we may not be awake or going to bed at the same time. Uh, when we can, we do. So that's the first thing we um, planning. And then the second thing is the structure to your prayer, which was also something that uh, only after years, you know, then we feel like, okay, this is the right format for us. As I shared earlier, um, it was difficult for me to uh, to pray aloud and then to also, because I think when you pray aloud, you have to formulate and you have to speak in sentences, right? And your head is like, God, this is what's troubling me, and A, B, C, D, E, right? Uh, so that took um, effort, but um, I think uh, generally the, the format is um, we seek forgiveness uh, for all that you know, we have, we have committed, all, all the sins that we have committed, or, you know, my sin of omission. Um, we give thanks uh, for all that we have been blessed with, whether or not um, there are things that we know about. There are maybe blessings that you just don't know of yet. And then, of course, there's the petitions, uh, which will be what we want to lift up for God, uh, you know, to work on, right? Um, but it's always with the caveat, which is, it must be subject to God's will. And it's also something that I think we struggle with. And you know, also we, we struggle with it a lot. Um, but we, do, we, we have come to realize that actually when you say, you know, God, if I would like A, B, C, D, E, uh, but only if it is in accordance with your plan, your timing, when you say it and you mean it, it's actually very liberating. I don't know how to explain it, but it's very liberating. and um, Especially for those of you who like to delegate. You can just delegate <laughs> to God if it's your will. Yeah. But we always feel uh, a sense of peace mm. after that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think, so the question was? Um, the question is, as a couple, how do we pray more yeah. regularly? Yeah. So, so I think going to Mass um, helps us, keeps us in check at least every week. Um, but what we also do is we try to find, uh, there are a lot of resources available for Catholics actually. Mm -hmm. There's a whole like host of novenas. Like ev for every saint, surely there is one. And I think try to yeah. build your uh, also try to build a community of uh, fellow Catholics or people who pray, mm -hmm. um, because at times when the both of you are tired, then yeah. it's your friends that will, will yeah. come in, your family will come in and pray together with you and pray for you. Yes. Uh, in fact. Uh, also knowing that we're not just praying for each other, like Christine said earlier, we have a format and after our own petitions, uh, we do pray for uh, our friends, our family, our pregnant friends, our soul in purgatory. So now it's like a duty, you know, I, we have to pray for the souls in purgatory and stuff like that. And that kind of uh, puts a bit more pressure on us to fulfill. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, we have another question, which is also actually very practical. Um, does quarrelling help maintain good relationship? Ellen and Marie, would you like to jump in on that one? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Alan and I are almost uh, the same age, just a few months apart. So most of our conversations start with quarrelling. <laughs> and our children are witness to that because many a times uh, during the dinner, now we have a, got a new rule that before dinner, we cannot start any touchy topics. Uh, do not start a conversation where it will spoil the dinner environment. So we try to uh, push it to later after our prayers. So After praying, that's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so most of the time our prayer time extends into discussions on values, on uh, certain things. And our children are very aware. Our prayer, prayer in the evening after dinner extends to about an hour plus mm -hmm. because we have our prayer time and then we end up talking about many, many topics. Sometimes we get uh, argumentative, mm -hmm. like a big discussion. It's not like we're fighting or anything, but it is that we, as a family, we are very open in communication. So if the communication or the quarrel ends up with making peace, or towards a constructive decision together as a family, then yes, it is good for the marriage. But if the communication, if the quarrel ends up in us having cold war or not talking to each other or like you know ignoring each other, not being life giving, then definitely it's not a good thing. Mm. The quarrel should be because it's something that both of us hold very dear to our heart. 
yes. a value or an ideal that we want to implement in our family. And it's how we want to do, go about doing it. So, so it has to be, it has to build up rather than tear down, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. One, one fundamental thing yeah. that I think for Marie and myself we practice over all these years is that we've never gone to bed uh, without making peace or, or reconciling, never. So that's a 24-hour rule that we have uh, no matter what it takes, but we have to com come to a compromise, we have to come to an understanding uh, of exactly the root cause of, of that argument uh, and resolve it in a loving, in a loving manner. So yes. we've, in all these years, never gone to bed uh, angry with That's each other. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's a wonderful feat. Because <laughs> sometimes I also am like, mm, too angry to talk, la. tomorrow. La. And yeah, we just end up sometimes really letting the sun go down on anger, but we shouldn't, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, we have another question, which is, um, can you elaborate on in-laws being the top cause of divorce? Maybe we let the lawyer answer this, Christine. Yeah, maybe if Andrew had continued on to be a psychologist, maybe he would have more to say than me. <laughs> but um, yeah, I wanted to clarify, it's not that, the, it's not that problems with in-laws lead to divorces. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, I think what quite commonly quite commonly the complaint by the by the suffering spouse is that her spouse uh, did not uh, protect, did not adequately support or even listen to her grievance. Mm -hmm. And I mean I've had um well, clients before, you know, they come to me and tell me um, why they want to divorce, but they don't talk to me about their spouse, they just talk to me about their in laws. So I realized that, okay, uh, I have to remind them gently that, um, you know, the, the laws in Singapore, they only provide for divorce against your spouse. Whoever you marry, you can't divorce your in-laws. And then uh, we have to tease it, we have to link it back to how, actually, the, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, they felt that the spouse wasn't there to, to listen or maybe didn't believe mm -hmm. or was quick to jump to conclusions or was quick to dismiss the complaints. So it's not so much the in-laws that are the problem, it's the lack of effective communication between the parties uh, and being unable to you know, re resolve um, the differences or maybe just being unwilling to listen. And mm -hmm. that, I think, goes a long way because when you feel that your spouse isn't listening to you or doesn't trust you um, and, is not, and was not trying to do anything to help you improve the situation, then the underlying foundation of the relationship gets injured. Yes. And thereafter, it's very hard um, for you to expect, you know, um, to, ex to expect a affection or intimacy and closeness, and then it's just downhill from there. Okay, yeah. so the issues are basically sometimes, even though the in laws may, on, on the superficial, you know, on, 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 on face value, it's the in laws causing problems, but when you dig a little deeper, you realize that the, the issue is the foundation between the couple. Ellen Marie, anything to add on this? Yeah, actually, I agree with Christine a lot because this one I've also witnessed and I've experienced it also that when you when the in-laws in-laws are not the cause for divorce, it's actually your partner. When you're faced by <laughs> faced uh, by uh, aggression or a rejection from anybody from your f husband's side or wife's side, you as a husband and wife must stick to each other, mm. must stand up for each other yeah. and support each other. United front, right? Yeah, united yeah. because you know your family best and yes. he will know his family best. So he or she must go back to their own parents or family and say that, please uh, give the person or like, you know, defend your partner. Yes. Stand up because respect, respect and love go hand in hand. Yes. As much as we respect our in-laws, our spouses must also respect each other. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think increasingly, um, that that's that's a very common issue, right? Where uh, spouses or even girlfriend, boyfriend, mm. fiancés yeah. have mm. very big falling outs because one party feels not protected or like the other party didn't stand up for me when your mother was talking bad about me or your or you know like your father said I'm not good enough and then you just kept quiet at the dinner table so i think that these things are important for the couple to acknowledge and to work through in their own relationships right thank you all right um another question a very interesting one um what does it mean for men or husbands to truly love and lead their spouses? Specific examples appreciated. 
maybe Andrew, would you like to take the lead on yes. this one first? Okay, thanks, Ashley, and thanks for the, the question. Uh, in the Bible, it does say that the, the, the husband is the head of the house, and I think this may context-wise be a bit more uh, in the time of which this was written. Mm. Uh, in this day and age where we have a bit more like equal um, stake in the marriage, mm. uh, what I understand, and this is my, my own answer, of course, please don't write to the bishop. <laughs> um, I feel like when, as what was mentioned earlier, it's uh, on me um, to lead prayer, for example. Mm -hmm. And coming from the service industry, it's when I lead uh, the household, I lead the, the wife I, in her service, I'm in the family service. Yes. Following what Christ has done, uh, the first is the last, last is the first, and we're all uh, our servants. Yeah, so when I'm leading um, the marriage or leading the wife, I'm making sure that everything is taken care of. I am anticipating what she needs and, and loving her, being, being life-giving. Yes. Okay, thank you. Ellen, anything to add? On this? The whole thing on marriage, as I think we've been talking through a few, uh, a few uh, just going back a little bit, mm -hmm. is about being life-giving. And, and for the husbands, because you know that you have to take the lead, it's just how it is uh, in, 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 our, in our families, in our growing up spaces. Mm. Um, it is just a necessity that you have to take the lead of actually doing things specifically. It can be very small things. For example, you know, taking the kids um, to drop them to school on a regular mm -hmm. basis when you know that your wife uh, could be busy doing other things, uh, all yeah. goes. Or uh, when she's ill, you know, just giving her a massage or asking her how she's doing. It's mm. very simple, small acts. So actually, um, taking the lead here is not so much what a lot of, you know, culture understands taking the lead as, which is like I'm the head of the household. You listen to me, and everything you, I say goes. But it's more taking the lead on showing that love and care and being that first, the person who takes that first step to show love and care for your family, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so following from the previous question, the other question is, which links, is what does it mean for wives to allow their husbands to lead? Marie, would anything to add on that? The question is, what does it mean for wives to allow their husbands to lead? Okay, so for us in our marriage, right, in the beginning, I was the one who was always coming up with all the ideas <laughs> and plans and decisions, but it took me a while to mm -hmm. understand and accept that Alan also has his own views. Yeah. He also has his own way of doing things and to respect that and to allow him to decide. So. In our, in our early life, we made a lot of boo-boos, made a lot of bad choices. We went and made a lot of wrong decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's because most of the time I would uh, suggest something and he will just uh, let me do it because he thought that that will make me happy. But then I realized that it was not good for our marriage. And uh, I've we have come a long way where now every decision we pray, uh, we sit down together first, we talk about it. And then we don't decide on it immediately. Mm. We will pray and discern. We let it rest for a while. And then uh, we consult each other again. And most many times, he's also the one who will take the decision. Like in our household, all purchases for electronics, big, bu big budget bu buys, he'll be the one, like car servicing, when it's supposed to be done. It's his la area. Mm. Where simple things like cooking, grocery, the children's school fees all is my decision. So, so we certain things are split. Yeah, we, Just, are, yeah. we do that as a partnership. Okay, so it's like an agreement that you guys, okay, I handle this and then I'll, I'll do this. And then as a wife, you just let him take the lead in certain decisions, but you have the autonomy to also make decisions in other things as well, right? Thank you. Christine, I, anything to add? I think uh, I'll just add on a, a short mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Um, like, Marie says sometimes uh, you between the between us we delegate and conquer, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so you um, if one person is going to take charge of this thing, then we respect the dis his decision to yes. be. But uh, there has never been a case where the decision is made without any input from the both of us and without consideration of um, the views from the both of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I th I think in the in the Catholic context, it's not the I lead and you follow. 
uh, full stop. Yeah. I think it is implied that I mean it, the the foundations of our of our faith is to be loving, right? Love God, yes. and love your neighbor, love your spouse, and that would never have been uh, envisioned if it was a bit more yes. of a command. Yes. So there's always that yeah. essence of respect yes. and a very large essence of love, right? Yes. Love but, first. Yes. But whatever decision that we agree on in the end, even if I may not. Uh, be fully um, behind there at the beginning. Yeah. I will still give my support. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you very much for that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. We um, Time is up. Unfortunately, we did have more questions, uh, but we're so sorry we can't answer all of them um, because of time constraint. So we have to wrap up today's um, talk. And um, in case you want to keep in touch with us, should you be inspired to join our community? We are very fun. <laughs> um, you can email in um, here. Um, if you want, you can take a photo of this. Um, or you can check out our newly revamped website, uh, CEE um, Singapore Espor.sg. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone so much for your kind attention. You've been a wonderful audience and I hope you uh, benefited from the sharings uh, from today. Thank you everyone. God bless. <laughs>